Welcome, everybody. It's absolutely fantastic to have you all here with Sarah and myself today. And I'm so, so excited to be able to introduce my very dear, dear friend, colleague and book mentor. Sarah is mentoring me at this at this point in time in, in writing a book. We've known each other for, for a number of years. And Sarah is a global book mentor. She is incredibly successful. She has over 100 published um, authors and runs the most incredible, extraordinary retreats all over the world for writers. And unfortunately, we couldn't make Greece this year because of COVID. But hopefully once every, everything opens up, um, that will be up and running, running once again. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Sarah. And as, as an entrepreneur and um, coach myself, as and I coach business owners as well as coaches and speakers, I just know the power of writing a book and what that brings. And I'm going to just do a little presentation at the end that will just tie this all together in terms of what writing a book can actually do for you as an entrepreneur, as a speaker, and as a coach. So enough from me. It's fantastic to have Sarah here, and I'd like to hand over to Sarah, and welcome, welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Heather. And I mean, first up, I just wanted to also say that, I've, yeah, as Heather said, I've probably known you for over 20 years, and I met Heather in another personal growth training room. Um, many, many years ago. And since then, I've known Heather to be a individual who deeply, deeply interrogates life and work and herself and what it means to grow as a human um, and as a business person. So it's also, um, I have actually done a number of entrepreneur mentorships with Heather one fabulous one you ran a few years ago, which was just so groundbreaking for me and shifted my attitude with money and my relationship with it. And I'm currently also doing Heather's Mastermind group. So that's really, you know, a, a fantastic process taking, re-looking at my business and what I want out of it, but also out of my life. So yeah, it's just so fabulous to collaborate with such a powerful and inspiring woman as Heather. <laughs> So thank you all, um, and I asked everyone to just pop in the group if they want to write a book, because I'm assuming you are on this call because there's something um, calling you about writing a book, or there's something you want to share, or a journey somehow you want to record. Can I um, share my screen, Heather, because it says disabled participant screen sharing. So when you enable it, I will just take you through um, something. So that what I'm talking about today is really, how do you write a book? Um, so let me just see if I can share my screen now, because I seem to be the co-host. I can, fabulous. And I'm going to move that out the way and do that. So, um, and this is really the question I think you have to answer yourself. You want to write a book. Or do you? Um, and that's what we're going to unpack today. It's really, and I'm just going to take you through, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of going to chat for about 20 minutes about the biggest things you really need to know to start a book and to really get a book um, re really ready and going that is a book that is potentially one other people are going to want to read. And I think the very first thing, and here we say we're all made of stories. What are those stories? Somebody said they want to write a children's story for their grandchildren. Some of us want to write a humorous story of our lives, as we've said. Some of us want to share our knowledge we've gained over all these years of work or of parenting or of dieting or of eating or of sport or whatever it may be. And I think really the first step you have to take into the realm of becoming a published author or an author is to really understand the trends. And very specifically, what books are really being published by publishers and bought by readers? And please note the date that I put here, 2022, 2023. And the reason I've put that is even if you start your book now in 2021, it will not be on the shelves before probably the very end of 2022 because a book writing process is a long one. And that is why the commitment is so big 
because to get your book on the shelves, it's going to take a minimum of 12 months of work and of honing and of tweaking. And that's why we want to know what the market's buying, because we're writing into a new generation. Um, nobody expects you to write a book that's never been written before. In fact, please God don't, because, you know, we don't want a book that's never been written before. Publishing is quite a formulaic and old fashioned tradition. But what we do want is we want your take, your voice, your ideas that speak to this generation. So here I was, I was in Waterstone Books in Piccadilly Circus. This is before lockdown. And I did a little bit of research. And I want you to go and stand in a bookshop and take a look at what books are being sold now. This is one of my favorite categories that is coming out at the moment. It's called Smart Thinking. And it's really powerful. It's set next to the highest selling genre, which is history, would you believe? History books. People love them. They love to record our times. So I went into the bookshelves to understand the power of the buying market because at the end of the day, you should be writing with an intention or with a purpose. And the intention really ultimately is to get your books published and sold. So we want to start the right way. And one of the right ways to start is to just also unpack the question of why do readers want to buy books? And there's two primary reasons we buy a book. And the first is to be entertained. And the second reason is to be informed. And I want you to think about most of the time when you make a buying decision with a book, what is the primary motivation? So most often, those of us who want to be entertained are buying novels or memoirs, which is personal narrative fiction, because we want to be drawn out of our lives and transported magically into somebody else's, be it where the crawdad sing, where we're in the wilds in a swamp, or be it in the world of Hogwarts with Harry Potter, or be it in D Dennis Leary's crazy, mad, celebrity-fueled life. We want to be entertained for those eight or 15 hours it takes us to read a book. The other reason we buy books, and that's the reason nonfiction sales are driven, is we want to be informed. We want to learn something new or we want to find out something. So I want you to start thinking about which of these will your book do? What's it there for? And to start thinking about what that means to the reader when they walk up to that shelf and start looking at the books that you're going to be putting on the thing. And this is a really great um, thing to just start thinking about, that your book, even if it's in your head now, even if it's as one of you said, it's in the, your file, Thinking of it coming out in one to two years, what is the market looking for? What are the trends? What is it going to do to help us navigate the times we're in? And quite a few of the books that I've worked on the last year, even though these books have been about something else, publishers have asked for a chapter on COVID or a chapter on navigating uncertain times. So we need to sort of be adaptable. I always say a book is something that should have longevity and should be timeless. Um, and if you walk into the business section of most bookshops, you'll see there are some books there. And I walked in recently and I saw um, the Paolo Cuela, The Pilgrim. I mean, that's been there for 20 years. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That book came out over, I think, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. He is still sitting Robert Kiyosaki's books on all the shelves and all the bookshops. So the two things to think about is how do I write a book that speaks to the contemporary reader and also that's not going to have a sell-by date? And all publishers are really looking for this, and, and that's books that sell. It's, it's really simple. We don't always know the formula, um, but we are looking for it. And as an author, as a beginning writer, you should be thinking, how will my book sell? And the second reason we publish books is we want to record history and we think books are important, whether they sell a lot or not. And so you can consider if your book may be one of those. It is just a record of the times. 
The second thing you need to know when you begin to step into the world of wanting to become an author that is read is this. It's not about you anymore. And if it's not about you, who is it about? It is about the reader. It's about that person who is going to walk physically into a bookshop and up to the shelf and take your book off the shelf. And this is the kind of reader you're speaking to in this generation, people who are consumers of lighter content. But the most important thing when we start talking about the reader and what shelf they're walking up to is the beginning of all planning of a book is understanding that. And the question you're asking yourself, which I'm putting in a simple terms, what book are they going to stack? What book am I going to stack your book on in a bookshelf? And a more complex term is when your book is going on Amazon, how are we going to load your book? Okay, because on the most basic decisions all authors make is, am I writing a novel or nonfiction? I know one of you is writing a children's book on this call, um, which would go in this juvenile fiction category, correct? But it would actually not. It would go in um, um, illustrated books. But um, the, the, the biggest thing is I want you to start thinking about where's yours? I'm going to assume that yours is going on the nonfiction. But where on the nonfiction? Because when you load your book on Amazon, you can only select two categories. So your decision-making process starts here. I'm writing a nonfiction, and it's going to be in the uh, business and money under the management and leadership. Or is it going to be in the self-help under the stress management category? So these decisions start to come in before, before you start planning what book how am I going to do this? How am I going to? You start saying where, what book is it? Further to that, not just in Amazon, do your books get sold by genre and category as they do in bookshops, but you also have an option of only selecting seven keywords that describe your book. So this is my book, which I had recently, and just start to look at how specific you um, the the, the decision making process is going in around book sales so start to hone in exactly what a reader is looking for when they walk up to that shelf your shelf and buy a book and the reason we are so particular about books going on the right shelf and being in the right place is because we are driven by a world of genre it is fueled by our next fix it's fueled by the fact that we have so little time to read books and we want to choose a book that delivers to us what we are looking for as we stand up and buy it. So if you're in any doubt as to what you like to read, please go and look on your Amazon recommended list. Because okay, th this is mine recently, but I can't lie. I'm not this intelligent. I was actually Googling or looking for some specific stuff. And when I went back onto my Amazon, <laughs> it came up with all these wonderful scientific books, which usually is very rare because mine's usually crime and romance. Um, that come up on my recommended list. So this is not my usual recommended list. So we've got to understand that you are getting into the, the realm of precision when you start now to think about your book. Where is it going to go? And why would somebody want to buy it? And how is it going to be stacked, stored, or presented to that person? But more than that, the fact that you're book is not about you anymore is really important because it is about the readers. So if you have a pen and paper, I would like you to just think about this. How do you want your book to serve your readers? Or in other words, what are they going to get out of it? What when they read your book? So if you just write three short things, what could they get out of it when they read your book? Because this is very important. Because I want to tell you that if I go to the bookshop and I buy a diet and detox book, I'm absolutely going to want a roadmap to do it. Okay, so if I walk up to the bookshop and I buy a, uh, I don't know, a sports, you know, couch to 5K running book, I also want something very specific. So it's not what do I want to share? What have I learned? 
But I want you to ask yourself, what does a reader want when they walk to this shelf in this bookshop and they pick up my book? Do they want to learn how to do a better sale? Do they want to know how to speak to their partner in a nicer way? What is it they're looking for right here and right now? And that's the beginning of moving into published author is not what I am going to want to say, but how do I deliver this in a way a reader wants to read? So very quickly, publishing is high standards. And if you want to write a book that's going to be stocked in a bookshop, you're aiming to write a minimum of 50,000 words. So I want you to just know that because I yesterday had a call with an author, an international business leader, who told me he's done his book and he sent it to me and I did a word count and it was 4,000 words. And I had to say to him, this is not a book, it is a brochure. So be sure what you want to write and if you do want to write a book, because there are many other options. You can write a fabulous blog. You can write a great magazine article. But if you want to write a book, please know that you're signing up for a big deal and a long deal and it requires a lot of you. And that's why not everybody writes a book. And that's why actually 2% of people who think they want to write a book end up writing a book. So the question is, are you one of those? And can you do the work that it takes? The next thing you want to know about writing a book is that structure really is your solution. Because often when we think, I want to write a book, it's like I've got this great mass of stuff in my head. Maybe you've lived something. Maybe you've, uh, you've mastered something. But the way you have to move your book into an actual written thing is you have to give it structure. And on the most basic level, you're going to look at one of three structures. So either you're going to look at a memoir, which is a narrative nonfiction, which is basically a story of the slice, a slice of your life, part of your life, an aspect of your life. Or you're going to be writing what we call a how-to book. Here's a fabulous example of a book I worked on last year that came out with Megan De Bayer. How to, and how brilliantly is this position? Because even in the cover, they're telling you that that's what it is. Or you're going to be working on what we call a big idea book. I think we all know a how to book, but what is a big idea book? Here are some examples. This is a narrative nonfiction. This is one woman's journey. This is a how to book. Look how specific this is. Here's a how-to book. Um, also one of my, well, these are all my authors as well. But um, how to make your money over at midlife. So what is a big idea book? A big idea book is like John Sarney's books. A big idea book is like a Malcolm Gladwell. It means you have an idea and you're going to go and prove it. So just think about what would yours be? Would yours be a narrative? Would it be a how-to book? Or is it a, I'm going to prove this concept to you? But the next way that structure is your solution, and this is very practical, the next step of writing a book is to drive it into a table of contents. So here's a more obvious one. This is one from a Brendan Bouchard's High Performance Habits. All books begin with a really simple table of contents. And a table of contents is a list of what, how you are going to most logically break the you up for your reader what you are going to share with them. And then it can be very unconventional. The one on the left is from a book called Eat, Shoots and Leaves. And it's about having how you can be, have good grammar. And then the one on the right is from I am Malala, the girl who was shot by the Taliban. And just look at how differently these authors have broken up books. But that's the start of it really, isn't it? You're driving your ideas into a really simple list. And that list is going to guide you. And equally, that list is an invitation to a reader who may not want to read about personal habits, but they may want to write, read about social habits. So that's the second step where structure holds you on. Do you have to be an expert to write a book? I can't tell you how often people ask me that and the simple answer is absolutely yes you do have to be an expert of something 
But it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a professional expert. As you can see, the book on the right was my second book, Romance 101, How Your Relationship Can Survive Your Kids and Other Passion Killers. Now, I want to tell you that I am really no expert on romance. <laughs> <laughs> or, but that didn't matter because this is uh, this idea is what you call a big idea book. So this was an idea a concept, and I went out and I interviewed lots of parents with children. But equally, so this is what the kind of book you'd call a research expert. I was a research expert in this book, and the second kind of expert you can be is an expert of lived experience. So that means. You have lived this journey. You have done it. You have been a meth addict. You have run that half, that, those 15 marathons. You have worked in sales for 50 years and you know some tricks to share. And the other kind of, the third level of expert you could be to write a book is a professional expert, like Jamie Oliver. You know, he's a cook, he's a chef, he's writing about cooking. Equally, this book, David Goggin's book, being on the Amazon bestseller list, New York Times bestseller list for almost 12 months now, he is a he's an expert of lived experience, but he is also a professional expert because it's what he does. It's what he, he is this. He teaches this. He's a, a Navy SEAL. So you ask yourself, what are you? Because you must be one of them. Because nobody wants to read a book about gardening by somebody who knows nothing about it or sales or all rare disease by somebody who hasn't walked the path. So how are we doing for time, Heather? We all good. Are we good? Okay, just checking. So let me remind you, we are talking here about what you need to know to get a book written and potentially sold. And this is the honest truth, is that your title and your subtitle, plus a cover, are really what sell books. In the nonfiction realm, because we are visual, and we walk up to the shelf, and we choose a book, and it's not that the title is something that's a copywriting, it's more than that. It's that the title of your book sums up what your book is about. In fact, the purchasing decision is made with that thing, rich dad, poor dad. In, in Just in that title, and please see the subtitle, what the rich teach their kids about money that the poor and the middle class do not. Now, who's not going to buy that, right? So implied in just the title is the fact that you can think rich or you can think poor. So this Simon Sinek, of course, starts with why. Look at his great subtitle. So what we're looking for in this is a, is a title that grabs your attention and a subtitle that clarifies exactly what the book is about. And this is really hard because it's asking you, this is mine and mine on the left, my last book, and look at that, write a book in 100 days, attention-seeking Quite a bold statement, subtitle, stop mucking about and just write your book. So start looking at the titles that draw you in, but it's more than that. It's, it's, it's asking you to say, what are you arguing in this book? Because all books are actually an argument. You're not saying, I'm covering everything you need to know about money. You're not saying that. The book's calling on you to be very, very directional and specific. And it's also, you have to have a solution for your reader. So we also have very unconventional book covers that sell books. So this is a huge bestseller on the left. And just look at that. So this is going to appeal to a different kind of reader. Um, and then, you know, on a most basic level, and I had a meeting um, recently with one of my authors, and, you know, once a book is commissioned and you've you got a publisher, the publisher is very invested in your book selling. You must know that. And we often brainstorm your title and your cover between the, the publisher, potentially your agent, and booksellers. And always we'll go with the, the title and the cover that most specifically speaks to what the reader is going to get 
out of the book. And that goes back to a very important thing. It's really asking you, your covers, what is the promise you're making to your reader? When they stand there and they take your book, and I want you to just to maybe take your pen and paper out if you're on this call and you've you've got that book idea knocking around in your head and write down maybe in just one sentence what when they breathe your book what is the promise you are making to your reader the promise in my book is you're going to write your book that's the promise So see if you can sit for a minute and then pop it into the chat if you have that. And we can just take a look. So some thinking work, and all this thinking work goes into books. So the last, as we move just towards wrapping up a little bit of this, is just waiting for the muse does not work. We all think potentially that creativity is something we are born with. You know, the people who are creative or write books are talented. But my experience has been that it is not talent and it is not creativity and it is not an innate genius that allows you to become a published author. In fact, quite the opposite. It is, it is discipline and it is tenacity. So it's an, and it is sitting down and understanding that the book writing process is a long one and that it is going to take you up to a year to get your book written. So what then does work if the muse is not calling? Because it doesn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't just descend this wonderful book concept. You know, J.K. Rowling says Harry Potter arrives in her head fully formed. But it certainly took her seven years to write all those books. So whatever and whatever you write, the process remains the same. You need a deadline and you need to book writing time in your diary because it doesn't happen. Every writer has got to do the work and the work really is sitting alone at your keyboard with a lot of time in your seat and a lot of time with your fingers just tapping on your keyboard. And, you know, you need to know what works for you in terms of getting to the end of a, a writing process. But most often it is simply booking that committed time in your book. I like to work with writers over four months to get a first draft together because I believe that there's a fire that should happen in the writing process and a, a speed. But um, you have to find out what is going to get you to the end of the writing process. And most often, it's not a thought process. It is simply just doing it. The second last thing I just want to say is the books are personal. They, that means that you as an author, books are not written by robot. They are not written by concepts. By, they're not written by organizations. Books are written by individuals. And what is going to be on the book is your name on the cover. And that means you have got to be in the book. Your personality, your opinion. And we are talking to this generation, which is much more demanding of authenticity and of realness, and of revealing who you deeply are and your stories. So, so that means that you can't write a book just about an idea. Even James Clear, Atomic Habits, he very openly shares of who he is and how he learned that. So what it means as an author is you have to start thinking about, and I know Heather's going to talk to you a little bit about later, is, well, who are you? What are you? And what are you really standing for? You know, what is it that you are really saying? Because nobody writes a book to just dump a whole load of random thoughts. It's not enough. You are in that book. And just look at the edginess that books have in this day and age. And just asking yourself, what is that soul? What is that essence? What is that essential you that you are going to bring to your book because writing a book can and most often will change your life because as a business leader or as a thought leader or as an entrepreneur suddenly having a book out there means 
you are a published author and you are going to stand and back that book for a very long time. I want to tell you, it takes me quite a lot to still stand up and talk about Romance 101, which was my book I wrote in 2005. So that's why you have to know that you'd really believe in this book, that you're in it and your personal stories are in it. The last thing you have to know about being an author is you just got to finish it. Because so many of us, and somebody said uh, earlier in the, the messages, they've got three books sitting in their folders, three fabulous, almost finished, almost finished books. And that's unfortunately where so many authors I've worked with over the years get stuck. You think it's enough to do one version of your book. Most often it's not. Most often it's not enough to do two versions. You have to go in a third time and sometimes a fourth time. And then you're going to have to send it off to publishers. And please know this, we always use this on our mentorship, is that done is better than perfect. It's never going to be perfect. You know, when we sent our book off, my latest How to Write a Book in 100 Days to the publisher, as, as it was going out the door and I was signing off the printed proofs, I was, oh, I could, I could fix this. It could be better. It could be better. It can always be better. But there's a point in the process of being an, of getting a book to the publishers in which you have to put a full stop on your book and say, this is it for now. This is it for now. And I am ready to take the next step, which is to get a publisher or to self-publish. And I'm not going to talk about that step now because my assumption is that many of you are still in the process of thinking and dreaming into your books and haven't written them. But once you have, then you can drop me a line or drop Heather a line and I will talk you through what can happen next to get the book out into the planet. And the last point is that just not everybody's going to buy your book. In fact, not everybody's going to love your book. And I want you to remember, and I just want you to think of your own bookshelf. Not everybody's going to read your book. And I want you to think of how many books you've got in your bookshelf, which maybe you've read a little bit of them, but you bought them because either you went to that person's talk or you watched them on a cooking show. Or you bumped into them and you somebody told you about them and you just love their vibe, their energy, and you bought it because you wanted a piece of that person in your house, just there. It's like an energetic thing. And I want to tell you that the, the guy who wrote The Octopus Teacher, Craig Foster, I, two years, three years ago, went to a talk he did and he had a book and it was ridiculously expensive. And it's this huge like this. It didn't even fit in any shelf. And I bought it. And I've never read it. But I want to tell you, I take that book out sometimes and I just put it on a coffee table. Because what he said that day so touched a part of me that I want him in my lounge. And I think that's important to know. When we get hung up on perfect, when we get hung up on, is this the right lesson? Is this the right vibe in my book? Please know that it's not always that that we buy books for. We buy books because we just resonate with the person. And look at this beautiful woman here. She's on the call if she's still here because I can't see. Nivy's book, Mind Your Own Business. You know, she just has such great lessons and she learned them the hard way and the things you don't learn at business school. And when I tell you, she has sold so many books and done so many talks and it's, people would never walk out of that talk without her book because she encapsulated. Same with Gabby Lowe. She sold... 20,000 copies, I think, of her book. And the truth of the matter is, is it doesn't matter who reads your book. It's the fact that you wrote it. And I'm going to ask you, and I can see back in the chat room, how many copies of a book you think the average author around the world sells? And I'm talking self-published, traditionally published, anything published, I want to see when I come back, pop it in the chat and I'm going to look and I'm going to give you the answer. So the reason we do our books and we do our talks is it's because the people who buy it are the people who are meant to buy it. They need to hear what you've got to say. They've got your message. This is Costa who wrote, I am Costa from Myths to Marathons. Um, 
And that's why we write books. And that's the fun of it, because we can't lose sight of that, right? That we're sitting here, we're sitting, we're carving out these six months, eight months. Everyone's out. Everyone's gone a Greek summer holiday. You're sitting behind a typewriter. But that's not the end game. The end game is this. It's the talks. It's the sending your energy out into the world. And it's also just that huge calling to share something you have lived or experienced. Because if it's not written down, it is lost. And the power, as we say, of every generation rests with the storyteller. And the storytellers who write them down are the storytellers who will be there long after all all else has passed. So I'm going to jump back into the room and see 20,000. I'm looking at what you think average 5,000, what the average author sells. And I'm going to tell you 10,000. Oh, my goodness, you would all be so lucky. The average book sells 50 copies. <laughs> so, let me not put you off. Um, yeah. And I want to tell you, I had a bit of a crushing moment the other day when I went onto my Amazon sales and we launched a book in the middle of lockdowns. It was an absolute disaster. And I went and looked at our sales over the last few months. And I want to tell you, we just peaked over 50. <laughs> so. Our algorithms went went perfect. Heather, mm, I'm going that? to come back to you and cool. say hello. So there's quite a few questions. Yeah. So Karaya has a question. What are the ranges for publishing costs? Mm. I'm going to be very quick with that. Um, when you are finished a book, your first aim is to get a publisher, a, a proper publisher, to publish it for you. A Little Brown, Penguin Random House, Strake, one of those. If all of that fails and you choose to self-publish, that is a time in which you will incur costs. Otherwise, the publisher will pick them up. And you can, uh, to, to get a book out and a printed copy can be anywhere from 50000 to 200000 depending on how many you are printing. Um, so, um, I've got a great article about advice of how many to print. Um, so many of my authors have, and if you are digitally publishing, in other words, it's just going on Amazon. So you're not, you don't want print copies in your hands. Your costs are going to be a little bit different. They can be lower, but no matter what you, um, print, you still have to walk through the path of going professionally edited, professionally proofread, uh, because there's nothing more detracting from your brand than an unprofessionally done book and that can do you more damage than good so you really do want to spend the money in the right place oh 100 percent, sarah and i think that you know thanks so much for all that amazing amazing information and just I know that um, there, there are a few key points there that I just want to reiterate around writing and it's been what I've been experiencing is that much like our journey as entrepreneurs, it really does take discipline, grit, um, self-motivation to actually sit and write that book that is inside you, that, that you want to come out and I just want to share. I just want to share a little, a very, very quick um, screen screen share with you, just from my perspective around writing writing a book and and why we would actually want to why we would want to do that. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm the founder and CEO of the Alchemy Academy, and what I'm really, really passionate about is creating su successful, prosperous, and sustainable businesses for my clients who are entrepreneurs, coaches, speakers, and, and consultants. And one of the things that I always am wanting to focus on when, when I am busy coaching somebody or working with them is how you are able to position yourself as an authority, as um, as a person who is credible, and actually, I've just as I opened this and I saw the word author, I thought, oh, that is the beginning of the word authority as an author. So automatically, 
being an author sets you apart from the sea of sameness and from so many of the other people who are maybe doing the same things as what you are doing in your particular industry. And one of the greatest, greatest insights and things that being an author allows your potential audience to have is access to you at a very authentic level. And Sarah mentioned that that we're living in an age now where we're so bombarded by this person saying that, you've got one day to register for this, you know, all those high pressure things that I just can't stand. And what people are longing for is they are longing for that authenticity, that feeling of being able to connect with you, to know who you are. And through that, that that builds an enormous amount of trust. And when you are an author, it also gives you substance. It's, it's a sharing of that expertise, even if you not necessarily are a um, professional, as Sarah said, you know, when she wrote her book, which is absolutely brilliant, The, the Romance 101, um, she went out there and she, she interviewed people. So it was a combination of her own experience of her children and the impact they had on her relationship, but also went out there and created herself as an expert because of the type of interviews that she did. So that gives you credibility. That gives you the social proof that people are looking for before they are wanting to work with you or they're wanting to engage with you. And I just wanted to share this process with you because this is one of the things that I offer and when we think about our book, there's, there's two ways that we, can, that we can think about the structure of our book, depending on what, um, what field we are working in. But if you're working as a coach or as a speaker or as an entrepreneur that is offering a service, then you can have a look at your book forming the foundation of the courses that you want to offer. So you could take your 12 chapters from your book and create a 12-week course or a 12-week mentorship program or a 12-step process that you would be able to take your clients on that journey. And it works exactly the same in reverse. So if you have a already have an offering that, that consists of a journey that you're going to take your clients on, you can then use that offering as a way to design the various chapters of your book. So you'll see I've always got the wolf around me because I am about flow, which is the word wolf in reverse. But the wolves is, and it's, it's, it's the book that I'm writing at the moment, is around wolf wisdom and what they can teach us about life, love, and leadership. And so that is already in the flow code of what I teach and what I share with my entrepreneurs. But what I wanted to speak to you about this high-end offer design process is because this is really a, enables you to unpack an offering that might form the, found, the very foundation of your book. So it starts with you. It starts with who your audience is. What is the problem that you're wanting to solve for your audience? And then diving into that essence that Sarah spoke about earlier, that we really, people really want to know who you are. So what are, are those life experiences that you've had? What, you know, I, Mowgli was, um, it was a book that I won in grade one for being the best reader in grade one. And that was really where my relationship with the wolves began was through this fairy story of Mowgli. And so when we look back and we reflect on our life and the life experiences that we've had, the challenges that we've had, if some of you've watched my videos, you know that I was really, really ill and had to come through that, that I've lost businesses and I've had to come through that, that it's sharing those um, stories in your book that is going to allow your, um, your clients and your potential readers to truly connect with you. And then we're looking, we look at that solution and we look at putting that strategy together and creating this blueprint, 
not the same as this, but a blueprint that would reflect who you are and the journey that you're going to take your client on. So similar to if you think about the worm, you know, the caterpillar being the most simple journey that I can think of right now, you start off as a caterpillar, this is where you are, the butterfly is where you want to go, you've got to go through that whole messy bit in the beginning where you you know, retreat and you'd go through this massive transformation process and then you come out the other side as the butterfly. And so I just wanted to share this with you today. You're welcome to take a screenshot of it, but it is a product that I offer um, over as a 12-step as a um, design, which can really help you put a design process in place that could either form the foundation of your book or become a journey that you take your client on that at the end of this you are able to show your clients the journey that that you are going to take them on so i am really about building that community that prosperity for you through business brilliance through leadership and as i said really being able to position yourself as an expert in your field that is going to make an impact on your reader and on your clients. And as Sarah mentioned um, earlier, she's actually attending my Business Brilliance Mastermind at the moment, and that's a 12-month journey that we go on where we really deep dive into your business. It's using certified entrepreneurial education that's been tested and tried globally with over 300,000 entrepreneurs. And the other opportunity, if you're wanting to write a book and you're wanting to create that structure, so as a speaker, you know, Sarah Wentz and she listened, listened to um, my octopus teacher, it touched her heart, it moved her so much that she bought the book. And if you had a course that would go along with that, if you're a speaker, you would then have gone through this 12-step high-end design process and you would be able to tie those two together at the end of that process. So if you're wanting to book a free call with me and have a chat or chat about your book or find out how to get hold of Sarah, of what we can do in terms of working together, then just take a screenshot of this right now or hold your camera up over it. It's going to take you through, if you just hold your camera over the link, it's going to take you through to a little page that you can complete. And when you complete that page, I will get in touch with you and we can, we can set up a meeting. It's been absolutely wonderful having you with us and once again thanks so much to Sarah for joining me on this webinar and sharing her incredible, incredible expertise and we look forward to connecting with you on LinkedIn, drop us an email, send us a message over LinkedIn and we will be in touch with you. Take care and have an awesome day further.